technology is private limited and uh, i think he has an office in it research park uh, iit bombay uh, i have seen him i met him uh, in my srm university he started it related with the uh, uh, mens sensors and all um, and uh, I'm, i'm sure this lecture will be very useful to you all and over to nitin nitin sir sir if you want to you introduce yourself you can please go ahead sir and kindly yeah yeah sure sure kindly switch on your camera okay for a few minutes i'll do that i just wanted to save on the bandwidth yes. so i was avoiding to yeah so i'll just uh, put up the lights also properly yeah i think so am i visible now yes sir yes sir okay great uh so at some point i'll switch off the camera Yes, sir. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you, participants, and thank you, Professor Vimla. So, we had met, I believe, uh, four or five years back at yes. uh, your conference. Yeah. So that was a uh, you know very uh, I would say huge event and uh, one of the most memorable events or conferences that I had attended. Okay. So uh, today. Uh, i shall be speaking about nano sensors and instrumentation uh, for chemical and biochemical sensing and uh, these are some of the devices that nano sniff makes on its own uh so there is some issue in changing the slide i believe that is why yeah it has changed okay so uh, today i shall talk a uh, little bit about mem sensors and actuators uh a good amount on micro heaters and micro cantilevers because these are the devices that we make uh, we have made a product uh, that is useful for explosives detection so i shall talk about that and uh, we have a prototype for uh, you know which can detect certain proteins and uh, biochemicals for infarction sensing so i shall discuss about that and uh, for the universities uh, and research laboratories point of view if they want to work with uh, mems devices mem sensors you know they need certain instrumentation they also need the devices so i shall talk about omnicant and sensimer also uh, so these are actually the instruments that we have developed for uh, researchers to enable them to work with Uh, these devices <clears throat> so uh, we are a, a technology startup company we were incubated at iit bombay and we focus on nanotechnology sensor based products uh, we are good at uh, sensor design at nano fabrication uh, we also do a good amount of uh, surface functionalization for bio applications a little bit on microfluidics and uh, processing biochemicals uh, we have a strong team that does uh, you know embedded systems uh, hardware software and co design and of course the products i have already discussed cantilevers and heaters uh, we have been funded uh, through various projects and through uh, equity investors so uh, as we are aware uh, you know um nano essentially is in the terms of you know uh, a few nanometers but even before that let us try to look at uh, you know what the size uh, uh, indications are so for example in case of i'll i'll just uh, check my slides for a moment and come back as well yeah so this is fine just wanted to see if i have not jumbled up here so you know macro uh, typically meters for example the room that you are in that's in meters it's a macro scale object uh, meso scale objects are something that we play with for example uh, you know rice grains it could be a pen the mobile phone these those are essentially meso scale devices and then you have the micro scale devices for example uh bacteria cells dust and then the nano scale devices 
Uh, for example, viruses, we know, we talk a lot about uh, the coronavirus, that's a nanoscale uh, object, uh, nuclei, uh, transistors. So for this, uh, when I say transistors, I'll pause for a moment and dwell a little bit more about that. Uh, so I think a huge amount of uh, people who are attending this uh, faculty development program are from the electronics and electrical engineering backgrounds. Am I right? So somebody could just confirm that. Electronics, uh, electronics instrumentation, electronics and electrical, electronics and communication. Great, great, ma'am. Thank you. So uh, when I say transistors, I'm talking about MOSFETs. And when I say MOSFETs and when I talk of nanoscale, then we all know that today the gate length of the MOSFET is of the order of a few nanometers. So actually in manufacturing, I believe even seven nanometer uh, devices are being manufactured. Uh, the mobile phones that you are using perhaps are using a 32 nanometer or maybe a 22 nanometer kind of uh, gate length devices. Now the beauty here is that we are not only able to uh, so you know we are not only able to uh, fabricate these devices of whose one feature size is at least less than 100 nanometers so it's important for being a nanoscale device uh, to have at least one feature size which is less than 100 nanometers and it should be machined by uh, us so it should it has to be an artifact right it has to be an artificial object that is machined by us so this is now different from you know films that are grown or nano crystals people talk about so that essentially is not nanotechnology because it's a growth process it grows on its own and you know forms crystal sizes of various nanometers but in this case we are very accurate so when we say 22 nanometers device, the gate length is at 22 nanometers plus or minus maybe one or two nanometers. And the third thing, third important thing is we are able to control each and every uh, nanoscale device. Each and every MOSFET of your mobile phone is controlled. Only then you are able to suitably use it. So these are nanoscale devices. And the technology that is used to make these devices is the VLSI. So somebody is the mic. Somebody's mic is on. Yeah. So uh yeah, so as I was saying that you know we are able to make these devices and the technology that we use to make the devices is the VLSI technology or the CMOS VLSI technology. And the same technology is also used to make MEMS devices. How? So we shall talk about that. So we know, uh, you know, why it is important. I'll just quickly dwell a little bit more. Uh, what happens is that at the nano scale, uh, things are quite different than what happens at the macro scale. For example, uh, if you just follow my cursor, then I'm showing vials which are having liquids and uh, gold nanoparticles have been kind of uh, suspended into them. Colloidal solution of gold nanoparticles. You can see that the solution is of different color. Okay. And what this is telling you, in fact, what I should also add is that this is happening because the gold nanoparticles are of different sizes. Now the message to all of us is that by changing the size of a nanoparticle, we are able to tune the optical properties of that particular material. So this is very important. So things become very different at the nanoscale. Uh, one another thing that you can uh, you know, know, again, since you are from the electronics uh, background, we know uh, that we need to use uh, the Schrodinger's equation and quantum mechanics, for example, to uh, to describe the behavior of uh, things happening or phenomena happening at the nanoscale. One example, uh, we all know that the uh, 
uh, I talked about gate length. So now let me talk about the gate oxide thickness. So there was a point in time when we used to use silicon dioxide as the gate element. Today we are using hafnium oxide. Why? Because you know we are using silicon as a substrate to make all the MIMS, all the you know, CMOS devices, and uh, silicon dioxide is very easy to grow on that. But then why to why do we go to hafnium oxide? So the reason for that was that as over the last 20, 30, 40 years, we started aggressively scaling the device size from you know tens of microns. Uh, gate length devices, eventually it became 100 nanometer and even less uh, gate length devices. So as the gate length scaled down, even the gate oxide thickness also scaled down. And uh, eventually, you know, at about uh, 65 nanometers, it was about uh, 65 nanometers gate length, the gate oxide thickness was just 2 nanometers. At that point, people predicted, and people started actually feeling that tunneling of uh, uh, the current is happening through the dielectric. So you know that dielectrics are insulators, but so thin a dielectric, uh, it is possible that it can start conducting a little bit of current. And that was dangerous because you lose the control over the MOSFET. So people had to move to a high K dielectric uh, and, and therefore they moved to half pneumo. So this is an example at you know, how things change at the nanoscale. Uh, the is uh, you know impact of surface to volume ratio is very important at the nanoscale because uh, you know if you look at this particular uh, slide you will observe that this is a one cubic meter or you know, sort of one cubic one meter by one meter by one meter cube okay. uh, it has a certain volume at an, and it has a certain surface area which is depicted here now if you uh, divide it into two, you know, all the faces, if you divide by two, then you will have eight such uh, objects, okay. The volume remains the same, but because the inner surfaces have been exposed, they are available for you to play with, what you will observe is that the surface area increases. And if you go on dividing the uh, cubes, then the volume will still remain the same, but the surface area is exponentially increase. Now what this tells us is that well, uh, at the nanoscale, the surface plays a very dominant role. Okay, the, the properties of the material are determined by the surface and very little uh, determined by what is inside it, what is the bulk. Okay, so this is again very important. I'll skip a couple of slides. Uh, maybe I'll just quickly very uh, very quickly tell you that as uh, please follow the cursor again as the length of uh, you know any object scales down then its resonant frequency increases uh, you would have experienced this if you have done uh, the experiment with a tuning fork in maybe class 11 or class 12 of your physics okay similarly when i talk about heat flow so through uh, uh, through thin uh, materials or to, through thin objects, heat flows very fast. Okay, so this is another uh, you know important uh, phenomena that happens at the nanoscale. Now you might wonder, you know, why do we want to make the devices small? And uh, I'll try to answer that from this observation or this table. So what happens is that uh, if we assume uh, an object uh, which is uh, having a volume of one liter, that is, let's say, ten centimeters by ten centimeters by ten centimeters, the typical milk pouch that comes at our home. Okay, that is one liter. Now, if you divide it by ten, uh, when I say divide by ten, I say you make it one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter then it becomes one milliliter or what you call as one cc. Okay. You further divide by 10. So it's one mm by one mm by one mm. Now it becomes a microliter. And then if you further divide by 10, it becomes a nanoliter. Okay. Now what does this tell you? 
so this tells you that let us say you know we are talking of uh, covid today okay corona uh, corona virus cases today and let us say you know you want to do a test which is the very popular not the rt pcr test but the rapid antigen test so in the rapid antigen test what you do is you take out the the blood and that blood is sampled now typically what the amount of blood that is drawn i believe is about a few ml for this particular test now imagine if you can do the same test with let's say a 1 uh, microliter or 1 nanoliter but that can happen only if uh, the device with which you are testing the blood sample becomes small that is why you know people are driving towards uh, reducing the size of the devices so uh, mems uh, that is the key top key thing that we are going to talk about today micro electromechanical systems it's a very popular term nowadays uh, it's called by different names elsewhere for example micro systems technology in the euro micro machines in japan uh if the feature size becomes less than a micron uh then people say that you know you have entered into a nems regime or nano electromechanical systems kind of regime uh the reason why uh, it is important to study nems is uh, depicted on this slide although it's a bit old i'm talking about 2016 data but what you can see is th is that today nems is a uh, you know Multi billion dollar market with applications in the automotives, for example, you know, a lot of your uh, vehicles today are coming with multitude of sensors. For example, you want to measure the pressure, or you want to measure the uh, amount of fuel, right? Or you want to measure the temperature. So all these are the sensors that are doing the job today are MEM sensors. You can see that it's a huge, huge market. and that is the reason why we as engineers and uh, you know should uh, should study this subject and why you know universities should also promote this subject in their curriculum uh, let me give an example of our mobile phone so you know in our mobile phone you have uh, the microphone it's a mems device you have your earpiece that is also a mems device you have rf antennas inside mems devices you have lots of crystal oscillators those are also mems devices when you tilt your screen uh, when you tilt your phone the screen also tilts right so you have gyros you have accelerometers etc that are built into the mobile phone so these are all sensors that are available inside the mobile and you can see that these are all mems devices and now since everybody is using a smartphone today you can see that it's a huge huge market and that is the kind of industry that should happen in india okay uh, with that background now i am comfortable to discuss about the work that nano sniff is doing uh, in the area of mems so i will start with a device which is called a micro cantilever uh, i hope you are all able to see the device then i will be able to describe it uh this dimension is l the length of the device this is the width and this is the thickness what you can observe is that the length and the width of the micro cantilever are much much greater than the thickness the other thing that you will observe is that this cantilever is hinged so it is connected to a huge uh, let's say a substrate okay at one face uh, because of this cantilever possesses certain you know unique properties so what properties are what are those properties first important thing is uh, that you know it is one of the most sensitive device why because it is practically free at ev at every end you know had you given one more support let's say you had given a support here then it would have become a bridge but then its ability to move would have reduced if you had given even two more supports here and here then it would have become a membrane so further you know its movement is going to be constrained but in this condition it is 
free it's it's extremely free it can become more free if you you know remove this support also but then you know you will lose control so with a decent amount of control with a micro cantilever device you can have a large uh, degree of freedom okay now i have talked about dimensions of course the cantilevers are going to be made up of certain materials and these materials are going to have their own uh, properties for example density uh, for example young's modulus poisson's ratio so these are important mechanical properties of uh, materials and you know when we are using a material we have to of course worry about the mechanical properties otherwise you know wherever we want to use let's say uh, rubber uh, rubber right to erase something we are not going to use wood right and if we want to make a door we are not going to make it out of wood uh, sorry rubber we are going to make it out of wood so based on the application we are going to select materials because those materials have uh, certain mechanical properties density as i mentioned or poisson's ratio or maybe you know electrical conductivity so if you want to uh, uh, you know use a wire you cannot use a wire made out of plastic you have to use a wire made out of metals right because that is what is going to conduct electricity so i have talked about dimensions of the cantilever device and i have talked about the fact that we have to worry about the materials right now <clears throat> i i had briefly mentioned about tuning fork so a cantilever can be used to measure uh, the weight or the mass how that can happen is uh, shown here uh, again i will take you back to 11 standard physics uh, please say a yes or a no uh, you would have done an experiment where you struck a tuning fork and you uh, heard the sound uh, you would have also worked with tuning forks with uh, you know different uh, uh, different uh, dimensions and you would have seen that you know the sound that is coming out is different i'm not sure if you did this experiment where you stuck something on the tuning fork and then struck it and then or try to observe the change in frequency uh, did anyone uh, do these kind of experiments just say a yes or a no As someone who has done a, uh, actually done that please say yes Oh really? So nobody has done that kind of experiment. Okay. So you know you have missed something. Ah, uh, okay, great. I have seen that someone has done that experiment. Good. So you know, because you know, it's such a easy experiment to perform. Ah, uh, as kids, you know, we tend to consume, let's say, chewing gum. So chewing gum is, I would say, one of the best things that you can stick on the tuning fork. and uh, then you can play with it right so you need to be uh, naughty to do these kind of experiments as well okay so uh, the point was that you know you can you can uh, change the frequency the resonant frequency of a cantilever structure or the tuning fork by sticking some to it so something to it now coming back to micro cantilevers if let's say a molecule sticks to a micro cantilever okay imagine a, a molecule sticking to a micro cantilever it is possible that you will be able to see a change in its resonant frequency now you can see that the cantilever becomes an extremely sensitive weighing balance it becomes an extremely sensitive weighing balance but unfortunately you know you cannot take it to your uh, a green grocer your sabji wala and you can ask him to measure those vegetables with the help of a weighing balance that is employing micro cantilevers but if you want to detect adsorption of a molecule on a cantilever yes you can do that and people have actually demonstrated that uh the next thing you can see on this part i'm talking of a chemical reaction uh which is either exothermic or endothermic and what you can see here is that this cantilever is made up of two different materials in yellow color and in gray color and there is a chemical reaction that has happened now 
uh, I'm talking about a term which is called as a temperature coefficient of expansion. So if these materials have different temperature coefficients of expansion, then because of the change in temperature, uh, they are going to you know, either expand or contract. But the rate at which they are going to expand or contract is going to be different because the temperature coefficients of expansion are different. So now what will happen? You know, because they are stuck, because they are stuck together, uh, they have to stay together. Okay. Uh, so what will happen is that because of this and because of the change in temperature, the cantilever will either move upwards like this or it will move downwards like this. Okay, based on whether it's an exothermic or endothermic and based on you know what is the TCE of the two different layers. So what I'm saying is that if there is a deflection in the cantilever, it indicates that there is a change in temperature. So now your cantilever becomes a thermometer. But of course, you cannot measure, let's say, your body temperature with this. But if you want to measure a change in, let's say, a thousandth of a degree Celsius, then you can employ micro cantilevers. Okay. Now, this is the application that NanoSniff uses. What we do is, this is called uh, detecting change in surface stress. And uh, from the coronavirus perspective, this could be an uh, interesting discussion. So what you can do is, let's say you uh, antibodies to the coronavirus on the surface of the candle. So these are commercially available. Uh, when I say attach, I use a very simple term, but actually you need to have a a certain amount of surface functionalization that you need to do. Only then uh, the antibodies will attach onto the surface of your choice. Okay, so let's say you have attached the antibodies to the surface. Now you, let's say, send a solution which is containing uh, coronavirus uh, stuff. Okay, because you know from basic biology that antigen antibody interactions are highly specific, then in that sample if coronavirus uh, is present, it will preferentially stick to the antibodies. It will be captured by the antibodies. Okay, And because of that, the surface energy of this layer is going to change. And because of the change in surface energy, the cantilever moves upwards like this, or it will move downwards like this. Okay, so this is the application, change in surface stress. <clears throat> now, uh, these are the ways in which, you know, the cantilevers can bend, whether it's a tensile or a compressive stress, but that's not important. What I'm trying to say here is that since it is, uh, looks, you know, it appears to be a curve either in this way or in this way, then since it's a curve, it tells you that the curve is going to have a certain radius of curvature. Now, the radius of curvature is given by this expression. And you can see that it depends. This radius of curvature depends on the material properties given by ECAP and on the uh, you know, geometry properties given by H square. Okay, so for example, that is the thickness. I think ECAP is also going to have uh, some of the geometrical component also, but E essentially is the Young's models. So it depends on the material properties and the geometrical properties. And it depends on sigma, which is the surface stress. And this sigma has happened because antibodies, uh, antibodies have captured the antigens. Okay. So the radius of curvature depends on the surface stress. Similarly, you can see that the tip of the cantilever, which was earlier here, it has deflected and it has gone down, or it may go up as well. So the deflection of the tip is also related with the material properties and with the geometrical properties. Okay, and it's also related with the surface stress. So again, if you can measure either the radius of curvature or the deflection, then you will have some idea on what is the amount of surface stress. 
I talk about the bimetallic effect, you know, the exothermic reactions and the two metal films. Uh, please forget whatever, please ignore whatever is present in this uh, part of the equation. Just concentrate on this part. Alpha 1 and alpha 2 are the temperature coefficients of expansion of the two materials. And this tells you that there will be a deflection if there is a change in temperature. If there is a delta T, there will be a change in deflection. But if the materials had the same TCEs, then the deflection will be zero. Okay. Uh, finally, this is another very famous equation from basic physics that the resonant frequency depends upon the mass absorbed. So if the mass absorbed changes, then the resonant frequency is going to change. And that is what we had talked about in the weighing balance example. Now, let us... Uh, uh, so we know that you know there is some sort of a deflection that has happened. I just have some water. Yeah. So there is some deflection that has happened. So how does the experimenter know that a deflection has happened? So one way is uh, called the optical technique. The other one is the electrical technique. You shine a laser at the tip of the cantilever. And the reflected uh, laser is collected by uh, an array of uh, you know, photodiodes, a position sensitive detector array. So if there is a deflection, the diodes which are going to collect the reflected laser are going to be different. And you will have a different color in some channel, etc. Sorry, a different current in a, some channel. We can work out the electronics for that. However, we do not use this method in, at nanosniff. We use what is called as the uh, electrical method, where we employ a piezoresistive micro cantilever. Now, my question to all of you is, uh, you know, what is piezoresistive? Uh, can someone very quickly answer? So you can see the, the cantilever structure is still the same. You have a structural layer, a piezoresistive layer, and a, you know, top, we call it as the immobilization layer. Antibodies are present here. And the piezoresistive layer is connected to an electrical contact pad. In a Wheatstone bridge configuration, in a half Wheatstone bridge configuration, uh, yeah, I will I will just come back to this, to the piezoresistive part. Uh, so in a half Wheatstone bridge configuration, one can act as the measurement device, other can act as the reference device. Or you can have a full Wheatstone bridge also. Yeah, now, uh, okay, now you can actually, whosoever wants to answer, please uh, speak out uh, so that it will be a little bit more lively session. Yeah, piece of resistance. Hello? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm not able huh. to hear. Sir, it is like change in the resistance with the application of force or pressure, sir. In the, it's a special kind of piezoresistive uh, material it will be made of, wherein the dimensions will uh, change with the application of the pressure. Okay. Any other answer? So I am happy to answer. I mean, I'm, I will welcome any other answer as well to this question. Okay. So we know uh, that, you know, if you look at a strain gauge, the gauge factor of a strain gauge is about 1.6. It's very small. Okay. This is because that the change in dimension of the gold material that is used, uh, when the gold, when a piezoresistor, uh, piezoresistive gold strain gauge is used, it's just of the order of 0.6. So effectively, you have got a gauge factor of about 1.6. Now, with, you know, what do you do to have very high gauge factors? This is the next question. How do you have a high gauge factor? By changing the material, sir. So what will that do? 
by changing the material how will you get or why will you get a high uh, a large gauge factor okay so i'll try to answer that question you know we know that uh, the resistance of a device the r is rho l by a right so we talked about dimensional change l by a change delta l by delta a but what is more powerful is the delta rho so if you can because of the application of pressure or because of a strain if you can change the resistivity if there is a delta rho then uh, your gauge factor is going to be extremely high okay is that clear now the next question which should obviously be asked to me is you know how do or why should uh, rho change or what is it that is actually happening when we say that the resistivity is changing that is obvious question right so then my question is you know why should resistivity change the conductivity changes when you stress or a pressure uh, the band gap so resist see resistivity and conductivity are actually uh, just the same thing except that you know conductivity is one over rho so we need to go a little bit deeper yeah when it is bent happens the resistance resistance will increase so the difference in resistance only we are going to calculate so that's a gauge factor no 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 we are trying to uh, trying to answer the question why something is happening because the stress due to the stress induced sir in the material, in the material. yeah why how does it affect how does it affect the no, resistivity or the conductivity no when we put the antibodies no some any sample so forget the antibodies no, no no please forget the antibodies forget the antibodies okay so we are trying to answer why is resistivity changing so uh, somebody mentioned somebody mentioned path taken by the electron constricted flow constricted okay well if you uh, again recall from your device physics courses or your device electronics courses you know that resistivity or the conductivity they depend on the mobility and the carrier concentration right yeah yeah e volt yeah electron mobility yeah. yes yeah yeah so it depends i uh, even whole mobility no issues so it depends on the mobility and the carrier concentration so this is changing now the question next question is if we say that you know resist the conductivity is changing then we are trying to essentially say that uh, the mobility and or the carrier concentration is changing okay now the next question is why should uh, because of application of stress or pressure the mobility or the carrier concentration should change that is the next obvious question so that is depends on the electron force right so the not on electron force no not on electron force no when the when bend happens the electron force that means the the adjacent between molecule difference between the space between the electron molecules get changed no no, no 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 if you look at the structure of the atom structure of the atom right there yeah, is yeah. huge yeah. amount of space huge amount of space in the atom so no worries so what essentially is happening is now if you if you recall again a little bit of uh, your device physics or yeah mostly device physics then mobility and carrier concentration both are dependent on the effective mass of the charge carrier both are dependent on the effective mass of the charge carrier now the next question is obviously why should the effective mass of the charge carrier change because of a change in stress 
so for this you need to go to what is called as the I, it now it's too deep of physics but i'll just answer it for the first and maybe the last time that is if you go at the you know uh, band diagrams if you recollect that and if you re recollect the ek diagrams then you will get uh, this information that because of the stress change you will have a effective mass change okay so now stress is, please try to understand that now stress from the ek diagrams which you know a lot of physicists have studied and uh, we will not go deeper into that but because of the or learning from the ek diagrams because of the application of stress there is a change in the effective mass of the charge carrier now if the effective mass changes the mobility and the carrier concentration both will change from the band diagrams this can be verified and if both change then the conductivity or the resistivity both will change and if resistivity changes there will be a change in resistance now what happens is that because of the change in stress if there is a change in resistivity that's pretty large you know you can have uh, your gauge factor in tens and even hundreds and people talk about you know carbon nanotube where the delta where the gauge factors are of the order of you know even 1000 so i leave this topic but this was a digression uh since we are talking of mems uh we need to make mems devices we need to you know have uh, certain tools from where we can get the mems materials so this is uh this was my phd work you know, i had uh, essentially integrated assembled designed and developed this hot filament cvd setup so which gave me uh the materials that are required to make mems devices so i will not go into the tool discussion because that's another one hour lecture uh but essentially because of the silicon nitride that i could get from the tool i could make silicon nitride cantilevers so now this part is the silicon nitride cantilever it is attached to the substrate here it is hinged and here it is free and beneath the cantilever you can see the surface of the silicon okay now what is also important when you are doing uh, mem studies uh, when you are studying the materials with which you make the devices you should know that you know okay i have used this hot wire cvd tool to get silicon nitride but is it really silicon nitride so you, know, you can do a ftir and see if sin bonds are present and that will confirm whether it's silicon nitride or not then uh, you know you can do uh, since we are using polycrystalline silicon also obtained from the hot wire cvd tool as a piezo resistive uh, device so it has to be a it has to be at least a partially it has to be a partial conductor not a semiconductor but a partial conductor i would say you know it it's not a very good conductor so it uh, we look at what is the grain structure of such devices that you can do with your xrd or uh, you can do the crystallinity measurements with the help of a ramans photospectrometer and these are so in these uh, materials what i was also trying to investigate is if we are at par with the materials that are obtained from the hot wire cvd tool uh, anywhere in the world so yes, we could do that okay. so after obtaining the materials the next step that people typically do is or the next uh, thing that people might want to do is simulating the devices okay so when i say simulating the devices uh, i don't know what tool you are using at your institute uh, uh, it could be either coventer or it could be intellisuit or something like that so it's not important what tool you use but uh, you know how that particular tool is used so we wanted to simulate the micro cantilevers you can see that i have the dimensions i have the various thicknesses the length width etc i have also put in the materials or you know and the thickness of each uh, material etc so the way we go for simulations is you know you define a process you can generate a mask and eventually you get a solid model that's important you get a solid model of the structure that you are trying to simulate 
The next step that you do is you mesh the active part. And this is very important meshing step because if you choose a wrong mesh, then uh, it's quite possible that you might uh, have results which are quite far away from the test, the test and measure kind of results, you know, the experimental results. So once you have done a proper meshing, then you can apply boundary conditions. And I say boundary conditions, I say that, you know, I want to apply a force of this much Newton here. I want to fix this hinge these parts, or I want to apply a voltage of one volt here and maybe ground this part, etc. So these are the boundary conditions. And now you are good to go. Uh, so these, for example, are the material properties that I had used for simulating my device. What it tells you is that you know you should supply the right material properties to your device. Otherwise, it will give you a you know, kind of garbage results. Uh, the next thing that you can do is you can tune your simulator. When I say tune your simulator, what I mean is that uh, for many of the basic results of a device, we have mathematical closed form expressions. What you can do is you can test your simulator uh, and see if uh, your simulated results are matching with the results that are given by the closed form equations. So that was done. For example, we deflected the cantilever uh, with a certain amount of force and we tried to find out what was the deflection, amount of deflection and whether it was matching with the deflection that was obtained by the closed form equations. Of course, it was correct, so it worked. Now, what are the interesting things that you can do in a simulation? You need to, of course, do something complicated, right? So one example is, let us say that I want to, so uh, this is the device that we are trying to simulate. Let us say, instead of bending, or I want to compare that if I bend it by a certain force, and if I stretch it by a certain force, stretching actually is going to happen when antibody antigen interactions are going to happen. So what is the difference? What is the difference in the piezoresistive behavior? Okay, so this was one question that we addressed. I won't go into the details. You can look at the at my paper. The other thing that you can see is that let us say that this is my piezoresistive layer. I keep it very close to the top surface or I keep it very close to the bottom surface. How does the device behave in terms of sensitivity for the same amount of excitation or the force supply? So that is another study that you can do. So these are some complicated studies that could be done. <clears throat> the uh, different things or other things that you can do is that, you know, I have simulated my model. What if I change the material properties of some layer or all the layers? What happens? Or, you know, I keep my piezoresistive layer here at the top, but I do the immobilizations at the bottom. So my immobilizations are far away from the piezoresistive layer. Then what happens? Then how does my device behave? So these are some of the questions that we try to answer. Uh, after doing the simulations of my own device, my own you know, structure that I had fabricated, uh, that I was planning to fabricate, I found that the stiffness as predicted by the simulator coventer of my device would be about 0.31 Newtons per minute. And then I went on to fabricate the device. Now again, fabrication, thing a device is a very involved process uh, for which you need to have access to nano fabrication facilities. Uh, it involves a lot of steps that include uh, you know, growth or deposition, uh, lithography, uh, etching, uh, stripping, and uh, lots of cleaning as well. So after you do a succession of all these steps, you eventually, so this is the process flow that I follow, uh, you, you are able to fabricate the devices. Now, these are the, the devices that I had fabricated. So this is the cantilever. These uh, two cantilevers in a half bridge formation. Uh, sorry, I had call. I just cut it. <laughs> okay, then these are the electrical contact pads. 
uh, because you know I have a piece resistive layer, so I have to make a contact with the piece resistive uh, pads. And then finally, this is the entire device structure that was fabricated. Uh, you can see that at the tip, uh, there is this is the cantilever part. This is the cantilever part, and uh, this is the entire die. Now this die is huge because you, know, you have to hinge your cantilever somewhere, right? So uh, what you can also see are these tracks. You can also see these tracks, okay, for the half bridge. And uh, we also wanted to make certain resonant frequency measurements. That is why we had uh, chosen the shape of the device to be fabricated in a certain manner. <coughs> Now comes the most important part, which is called the measurement part. So in the measurement part, uh, what we do is we uh, do a measurement where we try to bend the cantilever that we had fabricated with a cantilever whose uh, stiffness, whose mechanical properties are known. So that is indicated here. I am showing a, uh, a camera image. Uh, this is the cantilever fabricated by an external supplier. I can call it the standard cantilever. We know the properties of the cantilever. This is the cantilever that is fabricated by us. And we want to measure the stiffness of this cantilever. Okay. The stiffness of the top cantilever is no. What we do is we bend the bottom one by the top one. Now, when we bend it, it forms, it's the system is some, looking something like this. It is forming uh, two springs in series. Okay. And two springs in series is something like this, that, you know, you know, the stiffness of one cantilever. Uh, you are trying to measure the stiffness of two cantilevers in series in what is called as an atomic force microscope setup, an AFM setup. And you know one cantilever and you know the stiffness of the entire uh, series, you know, two cantilevers in series from the AFM setup, from that particular measuring instrument. So if you know one and if you know the total, then you can extract the stiffness of the other one, you know, the cantilever that we had fabricated. So we found out that uh, our stiffness, uh, so this essentially is the measurement procedure. I will not get into this. Uh, you can look at uh, my the literature in my paper. But we found out that the stiffness of my cantilever is about 0.25 newtons per meter. So you can see that it is very close to 0.31 newtons per meter. So we had done a reasonably good simulation. And uh, we were also successful in measuring the stiffness of our device. Uh, as I mentioned that, you know, we wanted to measure the resonant frequency of our device. Uh, we had fitted our cantilevers into the nose of the atomic force microscope. And then we had actually vibrated it uh, using the vibrator of the AFM setup. We found out that the uh, resonant frequency is of the order of about 40 kilohertz. So it was far, quite far away from the uh, thermomechanical noise that is typically present in the atmosphere. And the third thing is, you know, to know whether the device is actually, the cantilever device is actually behaving as a piezoresistor. Because now you have a very small structure, right? So what we did is we built a electronic uh, setup, electronic setup. It had all those stuff, you know, lock-in amplifiers, current sources, uh, etc. And we uh, we had used this setup along with the probe station. So I'm not sure if you have used the probe station, but you know, probe stations will have certain micrometer screw gauges. So you can precisely bend the cantilever. You can probe the cantilever, of course, but you can also bend the cantilever with the needle or with the tip of the probe. The given cantilever tip deflection, we found out that there was a change in voltage, which could only happen because there was a change in current or the change in resistance. <clears throat> so, yeah, our devices were working as piezo-resistive cantilevers. Now, these are some of the cantilevers that we are 
nowadays these are made up of different materials the earlier ones that i had shown you were made up of polymeric materials these are made up of inorganic materials such as silicon dioxide silicon nitride etc uh, the brown layer that you see this brown layer this is uh, polycrystalline silicon okay that is also acting as a piezo resistor here ah uh, this is that this is the process maybe i just skip this yeah one important so it's not very easy to make uh, mems devices or any or, you know fabric nano fabrication technology is a challenge so one important thing in making the devices is the process of release because you want that the cantilever should be hinged only at its base there should be nothing below the cantilever so that it is able to move and that's quite a challenge so what had happened is that initial experiments we had lot of silicon beneath the cantilever then you know we had silicon just here you know the black that you see here this is the silicon otherwise the cantilever is released and here what you can see is that the black has reduced to just something at the very end otherwise the cantilever is released and finally if you the, these are the cantilevers that we make today a little bit bent at the tip initially when we made the devices we had observed that the cantilevers were highly stressed it gave were coming out in a shape like this just as if it's a trunk of the elephant and saluting some so we uh, did a lot of engineering in terms of thermal processing a lot of i would say uh, you know different annealing techniques were used and eventually we managed to straighten our cantilevers so now we have got reasonably straight devices okay now come uh, the applications part of it <clears throat> so you know i talked about you know we made cantilevers we made cantilevers but uh, you know what is the application so we go into that mode now uh, the application that we were interested in was to detect explosives uh detecting explosives is quite difficult because they have a very low vapor pressure and they tend to stick to surfaces uh, as you can see uh that the vapor pressure is in the order of millitor or nanotor for most of the well known explosives so our idea was something like this that let us have a coating of a layer that has an affinity to explosives and then let us introduce explosives uh, to the cantilever structure which is having that coating then because of the adsorption selective adsorption or because of the affinity of the layer to the uh explosive vapor molecules there will be binding and because of the binding there will be a bending of the cantilever so it is the bending that we should be able to pick up that was the whole idea so what we did is we developed a setup a handheld setup so this handheld setup had a lot of things inside it had a pump of course it had cantilever and some sort of a cell it had all the electronics which was continuously monitoring uh, the resistance of uh the coating that we had used was called as 4 mba some sort of a metha methyl benzoic acid or something and uh, we had exposed the cantilever to vapors of explosives and we actually found that you know it deflected when either tnt rdx or pdn was exposed to it however we faced a challenge and the challenge was that you know our cantilever uh, sensor was not very selective so it was responding to a lot of other uh, chemicals for example water vapor or shoe polish or a lot of uh, you know perfumes so it should also be highly set select it is not important that it is highly sensitive so it should be highly select therefore we changed the technology 
Uh, today we are making what are called as micro heaters or micro hot plates. Uh, I'll just describe the device. This is an electrical resistor made in platinum, 10 microns wide, that acts as a heater. This is another platinum, electrically isolated, that acts as the uh, temperature sensor. And this is, uh, both the platinums are sandwiched between two layers of dielectrics. Okay, so this transparent thing that you see, or translucent thing that you see, this whole thing, this is actually a membrane. Okay. Now, you can use this, you can apply a voltage here and uh, you know you can heat the cantilever structure as I shall show, sorry, the microheater structure. And because the, uh, the temperature sensor is so close to the microheater and it's in the same plane, in the same membrane as well, uh, you can measure the temperature independently in real time and in situ. So all these things are important. Uh, typically, the heater goes from room temperature to 500 degrees Celsius in a few milliseconds. I'll just show a small quick demo of uh, the microheater. Please remember that it is driven by a low frequency sine wave so that we could actually capture the video. Okay, so the red hot thing is actually the filament that is heating and if it was driven by a pulse, it will heat up really fast in a few milliseconds. Now this is used for doing what is called as a deflagration event of the explosive if it is present in the sample. So we transfer the explosive onto this micro hot plate and then we have way of you know heating up the micro hot plate uh, through external power supply. What we observe from the temperature sensor is that if there is a deflagration event, then there is a small change in the temperature of the membrane, which the temperature sensor is going to pick up, which is depicted in this graph. However, if you have salt and sugar, which are non-explosives, then you will have a sort of a flat curve. And then you can use some very intelligent algorithms to tell whether the sample that was present to the micro hot plate was explosive or not. Uh, we have developed a product called as NanoSphere. It's an explosive trace detector. It can detect 10 nanograms of any explosives, less than 10 nanograms. Uh, we require just 10 seconds for the detection. The, it is, the instrument is cleaned up within a minute and it's highly selective, less than 2%, I would say, false positives. It's handheld. It works at a wide range of temperatures, even at 55 degrees, at the, you know, 55 degrees ambient that is. So it can work at Chennai for sure. Chennai is, I believe, uh, 45, 43, 44 degrees Celsius in summers. It can work. It can work even in Rajasthan where the temperature goes to 47, 48 degrees Celsius. So I'll just show a small video of the instrument. And first go around it. So now what the operator is going to do is she is going to insert a swap, which is a blank swap, so it does not have any explosive on it and she will run the device. So in about 8 seconds, a message will flash here 
saying trace is not detected. You can see the message that has come. Now she will insert another swap which is having 10 nanograms of RDX on it and she will again run it and in 10 seconds or 8 seconds you will get a message here in red color saying traces detected and you will also hear a faint B. Please try to catch it. I will play this once again just for the beep. Okay, I hope you were able to catch the beep. Okay, so that was one product that we have developed. Uh, we have also launched it in the market. Uh, now about, you know, uh, since I talked about uh, cantilevers, I should talk about the application that we worked on for uh, uh, the cantilevers. So in case of cantilevers, we know that, in fact, before discussing that, let me uh, discuss a little bit about uh, uh, the cardiac disease situation in India, which we know is quite severe. Uh, uh, you know, India is supposed to be the heart disease capital of the world today. <clears throat> and uh, what doctors say is that uh, they need some sort of a uh, device uh, which can quickly tell whether a person is having a heart attack or not. Because the problem is that, you know, a heart attack is difficult to detect in the early stage uh, for a doctor also because 50% of the uh, ECGs, or sorry, heart attacks, they will not show up in ECGs. They are called as non-STEMI attacks. And then uh, you know, ECG is a historical record. So if someone has had an attack in the past that will also show up as an ECG change. So it's difficult. Uh, a chest pain could be because of gas, a pain in the shoulder could be because of a heart attack. So doctors actually need uh, a good instrument to say whether you know it's a heart attack or not. <clears throat> the physicians, the doctors also say that they want to have it early because you know the golden hour, the first one to two hours after the after the onset of chest pain, if they can treat the patient during that time then the damage to the heart muscle is substantially uh, you know, arrested or it is stopped. However, uh, you know, if somebody has a chest pain, uh, then for that person to have uh, what is called as uh, his cardiac markers tested, which is supposed to be the most uh, reliable test uh, today uh, to tell whether a person is having a heart attack or not, that will take easily four to six hours because the blood sample has to be collected, it will go to a big pathology lab and then there they will do the testing and maybe after four to six hours you will get the report. Okay, so uh, this, what it tells is that, you know, if it's a situation in rural India or semi-urban area, India, uh, then the problem is going to be even more severe. So there is a need for a smart and inexpensive point of care sensor that can rapidly detect heart attack or myocardial infarction. Uh, so these are the cardiac markers that I just briefly talked about, myoglobin, troponin, uh, fatty acid binding protein, etc. So these are released at different times. In the blood. Uh, I talked about this earlier also. I will 
again uh, discuss this briefly that this is the antibody structure this entire part is common for all antibodies only this part is different for different antibodies and the shape uh, is governed by you know, what antigen it is targeting uh, these antibodies are immobilized on cantilever surface through a process you know you apply silanes you apply linker molecules like glutaraldehyde then you put in antibodies and then antigens of course there are steps during which you are going to do what is called as incubation uh, first before doing you know electrical measurements or optical measurements you try to do microscope based measurements where you essentially uh, on the surface or on a cantilever you apply uh, your antibody then you introduce the antigen do the incubation and then you introduce a secondary uh, antibody which is having a fluorescent tag and then if you know the, the immobilization was successful only then you will be able to see fluorescence on your devices but then you know this is not a good way it's a very expensive way to detect something you need something uh, so these are some of the experiments that my friends did uh, at iit bombay several years back Uh, so, for example, they could uh, detect uh, human IgG with uh, micro cantilevers, but this was optical detection. They also detected myoglobin, again another optical detection, but uh, yeah, they were able to detect it. What we did at NanoSniff is we built a setup. So this is having all the electronics which is monitoring the cantilevers. Uh, this is the PCB. that is having the cantilever dye it's also hosting or holding a liquid cell through which the liquid is going to come in and go out it's important that the liquid does not spill over to the electrical pads of the cantilevers otherwise there will be a short and then you have a syringe pump arrangement so through this syringe you are going to pass the control liquid and through this syringe you are going to force or using this syringe you are going to force the liquid which is having the antigen so this is the setup now what do you do with this so when you experiment uh, and after experimentation you get a certain result the result looks something like this so first uh, we flow pbs that is your saline solution allow the cantilever to equilibrate then after it is equilibrated you know stable we put an anti human human immunoglobin because human immunoglobin was uh, was incubated and immobilized on the cantilever surface so this antigen is going to traverse all the way it takes a certain amount of time and it reaches the cantilever so once it reaches the cantilever the ca on the cantilever there is going to be binding of the antigen and the antibodies there will be a bending and there will be a change in resistance experiment has been you know, performed multiple times with multiple antibody antigen combination and we have and the follow is been successful okay even with troponin with myoglobin as cardiac markers <clears throat> okay now i talk about something that could be of interest to researchers and faculty uh, which is you know uh, if i give you cantilevers then what do you do with it you need some sort of a instrument to experiment with it so one that experiment is omnican with this you can do what is called as the head space analysis okay. uh so when you when i say head space essentially I have a vial and on this vial the vapors of whatever liquid is contained in the vial is going to be present are going to be present if you have a mechanism of taking these vapors through the cantilevers then you can do some sort of a analysis of the head space or the vapors so this is the omnican setup uh what you can see here is that uh, you can fit your vial these vials can be fitted here uh you can heat so there is a heater here so more vapors can be generated you can see a couple of tubes here so you can bring a carrier gas from outside and there is a mass flow controller so you can control the flow rate of the carrier gas so this carrier gas can come in 
it will take the vapors and it will go from to the other tube and it will come to the reaction chamber so in this reaction chamber you have your cantilevers so this is the cantilever setup this is the electrical connection here you are going to have another sort of a fitting uh, which is going to fit in the reaction chamber so in the reaction chamber the cantilever is going to interact with the volatile organic compounds and uh, the omnicant setup also has all the electronics that is going to monitor the resistance of the cantilever uh, in real time so when you do an experiment you get a result something like this you put on put in the acetone vapors change in resistance you can see you put off acetone you will see a change in resistance and this is repeated uh this you can see a drift in the electronics this was our first experiment mind you then about 10 years uh, about 9 years back since then we have corrected the drift there is no drift in the electronics but we like to show this result because uh, you know everything worked perfectly the very first time a good amount of planning had actually gone okay <clears throat> now the experiments that you can do with omni candles you, know, you can change the coating on the cantilever you can change the volatile organic compound you can change the temperature of your reaction chamber or uh, the vial uh, heater you can change that you can change the flow rate of the carrier gas so now you can see that you can do hundreds of experiments and you can publish papers right so there are several people who have actually done that so this is one second is you know if i give you micro heaters what do you do with that So again, uh, we have a setup called as a sensimer setup. Although Isense is written here, but we have a setup called as a sensimer setup, uh, which allows you to play with microheaters. So what can you do with microheaters? You can, uh, for example, apply a square wave. You can apply a voltage to the microheater. You can measure the uh, resistance of the temperature sensor. You can convert it into, uh, you know, how much is the temperature of the membrane. You can apply a pulse you can apply a square wave you can apply a sine wave or a uh, you know sawtooth waveform all sorts of waveforms can be applied to the microheaters and uh, then you can also measure you know what is the rise time what is the fall time so that is again interesting uh, these those are again interesting measurements uh, you can do something even more you can put a grain of salt on the membrane and because you have now increased the thermal mass you will see that you know the rise time increases and the fall time increases so a lot of interesting experiments can be done with sensimer and with microheaters so again you will see a lot of uh, college laboratories in india are having these devices <clears throat> okay so uh these are the devices that we are making nowadays for example microheaters with interdigitator for uh, iist uh, trivandrum they wanted to detect gases and they were successful in doing that so uh that actually ends my talk and this is just my last slide uh this is not mems now i am talking about something different uh, it's called the pasteur quadrant uh we all know louis pasteur the famous scientist uh this uh, pasteur quadrant is taken from a book written by donald stokes called uh, pasteur quadrant basics science and technology innovation published in 1997 so what it does is it tells you or it plots essentially knowledge creation versus knowledge utilization and uh, creates a quadrant so the first quadrant is what is called as the uh, you know where knowledge utilization is low and knowledge creation is also low so that is the typical you know teaching oriented uh, research uh, this is similar to what sukrat the philosopher the famous philosopher sukrat was doing there was no knowledge utilization there was no knowledge creation in his teaching oriented research then you have what is called as pure applied research so this is what thomas alva edison was doing who invented in fact the electric bulb who discovered or who decided through experiments to use tungsten as a material for the filament for his pump so in his way of research 
uh, you know, knowledge utilization is huge, but there is no knowledge creation. I can give an example. Uh, his competitor was Tesla, and Tesla said that you know Edison took something like forty thousand experiments to find out that material turns. So that is all donkey work. That was not smart work. Uh, Tesla would Tesla was a smart guy, so he said that you know we could have done it in half a dozen experiments. It was very brilliant, Tesla. So uh, this is typical pure applied pure applied research. Then you have what is called as pure basic research. So Niels Bohr, uh, knowledge creation was huge, but in his times the knowledge utilization was not. So uh, is supposed to be the father of the quantum mechanics uh, stuff or the quantum mechanics approach uh, he uh, postulated and formulated the model for the hydrogen atom uh, which was quite a phenomenal success during his days so you can see that huge knowledge creation was done but knowledge utilization wasn't there and then finally you have you know the use inspired basic research which was what louis pasteur was doing an example uh, louis pasteur knew that you know or saw that the milk was getting bad uh, right uh, it was curdling or it was uh, going uh, smelling bad it was going bad he investigated why it was going bad he looked at uh, the curdled milk under the microscope he found out something moving which he identified as bacteria microbes right. and uh, since he identified them as uh, living beings he knew he could kill them with heat treatment so uh, earlier it was suggested to give a 65 degrees temperature to the milk for 15 minutes but today we bring the milk to a boil and keep it there for about 10 15 seconds or so right so the important thing here is that because of this use inspired basic research louis pasteur's method is followed worldwide in fact even in his days people started following it worldwide so what i was trying to say is that you know at nanosniff we try to choose a fundamentally new or novel phenomenon or we uncover the basic science underlying it and then we translate that knowledge into an application so so we are trying to have a path where you can have uh, creativity and you can have scientific rigor as well you can do the experiment for example with the explosive detector we would have done you know more than 10000 experiments i would say to build all those algorithms and to build a uh, confidence and to you know improve the selectivity so thank you thank you everybody Uh, if there are questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Yeah, questions, please. so no questions yeah there is some question yeah uh, can you speak up so that you know people can can you speak up please because you know the questions are flashing up here and i am not able to complete reading them So I'm not able to hear. So I can unmute all. Then maybe now you'll be able to speak.
Okay, so uh, Professor Vibla, I think there are not many questions. So maybe we bring the session to the end. Uh, so thank you. And uh, that's all. With your permission, I can disconnect. हेलो हाँ सर ऑल दिस फैब्रिकेशन एवरीथिंग वाज डन एट आई Uh, we do use IIT Bombay's facilities and IIT Bangalore's facilities. Experimentation we do it at our lab. See Bangalore, sir. Fabrication work we do at IIT. IIT, please. So characterization, sir. Characterization. Many of the setups we have in IIT Bombay, and we also have a few characterization setups uh, in our companies. Okay, okay, okay. Fine. So now, if you want to go for any further uh, uh, development or fabrication of sensor mills, then we have only option is to go for IIC, sir. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, the nano fabrication facilities are there at very few places in India. So whichever actually suits you, you can actually take that lab. So I think uh, like under NUP and all, as uh, someone uh, like uh, they mentioned, uh, it's over and uh, uh, like yeah, under what over. category can we approach? So yeah. NUP is over. Now how can we approach? Sir, uh, Madam, NUP is over. NUP was a scheme yeah. where central government was funding your fabrication. Uh, now that yes, scheme yes, is yes, over. Yes, 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 sir. Now uh, your university will have to fund your fabrication work, and they have I okay. think a special rate for university. But you know you pay and you fabricate. It's not difficult. Okay. Okay, it's like that now. Yeah, use and pay. Yeah. Okay, fine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, most welcome. Yeah. Okay, so then I will just disconnect. For grazing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today, sir. Also, we are really enlightened with your knowledge, invents, and its fabrication, and your presence. Further, we are grateful to, sir, for explaining the first two things like resonance frequency measurement, electromechanical characterization, and applications of these challenges. I would like to express our sincere thanks for giving us excellent coverage to all the. Mems are based on fabrications, a micro heater. We are inspired by your great talk, sir. Thank you once again. Thanks to our faculties and research scholars for active participation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I get in touch with you to make sir. Little sir. Thank Next session will start at uh, two p.m.